Hey there Ebenezer Youth, my name is Will and I'm the youth pastor here at Ebenezer and I have a message for you today. I'm going to be kicking off our brand new series on questioning Christianity. That is what we're titling our new series. If you take a moment to think, have you ever questioned Christianity in any form? From whether you've doubted if God exists or not, from whether or not Christianity is the right religion, to if God is good, why is there suffering? My guess is that you have questioned Christianity whether you would consider yourself a follower of Jesus or not. And when we have these questions that we have, because it inevitably happens to all of us, we tend to do one of two things. Number one, we bury our deep questions even deeper, but we don't ask them. This is the most unhelpful. Number two, we look it up on Google, and Google does not give as good of answers as we think it does. But when we question faith, which is not a bad thing, but when we do, we need to investigate the truth. And interestingly, some people do not immediately look to Christianity when looking for the deepest answers to the deepest questions. But in this series that we're going to embark on together, I want to propose that Christianity is in fact very deep and goes much beyond a basic Sunday school answers one might get. Answers that are helpful, knowledgeable, and make sense. And this is why, in these next couple months, we are going to be answering here at Ebenezer Youth some of the most difficult questions that life may present you with. Today I'm going to walk you through and explore the question, does God exist? And next week our friend Ehor is going to be walking us through, do I have to choose between science and faith? Then we're going to look about, do all religions lead to God? And lastly, we'll have a guest speaker come in and talk about, if God is so good, why is there evil and suffering? This series is essential because here at Ebenezer Youth, we do believe that Jesus, the person of Jesus, gives the best answer to the biggest questions of life and provides us with the best way to live. And this is why we're going to be questioning Christianity itself and we're going to be talking about some of the hardest questions and at some point or another, we will ask all of these questions. So at the end of the day, you have to choose if you are going to follow Jesus in the context of the Christian faith. But nonetheless, today we're going to be talking about something very heavy. As I said, we're talking about does God exist? So for today, I want to be able to evaluate this question with fairness. I cannot promise you I will be unbiased because no matter who we are, we will always come with some sort of bias. However, I want to come at this in fairness. And whether you disagree with me or not on the conclusion I come to, I want to ask you to come in a humble way as I talk. And I ask for myself to do the same. I want to come at this in a humble way as I talk too. But on a personal note, why I have put a lot of thought into this question today is I did not grow up in a Christian background like many have. I was never raised to follow God and lack for a better terms. I did not grow up thinking there was even a God who existed. So I actually come at this topic with a bit of a different angle and it's something I would like to call a bit unique. But the last thing I, before we dive in to this topic today, as I speak, I want you to start thinking about the questions you have about this topic. Feel free to DM them to us. Feel free to drop comments in the section. When you have questions, you need to ask them. That's all what we're doing here. We are questioning Christianity and finding Jesus-centered answers and approaches to it. So think about your questions. But before we just get into what we're going to be talking about today and laying down the foundations, let us begin in prayer. So join with me as I pray. God, I pray that as I speak, you would give me the words to say, you would allow me to come in a humble, meaningful, and loving way, and you would allow me to speak by your Holy Spirit. Amen. I fundamentally believe the first question anyone asks in life is this, is there meaning to life? This is a question all thinks about, and inevitably it has to cross your mind because we are humans, and we are made to seek to understand and seek meaning. And at the end of the day, almost everyone will say yes. There has to be a meaning to life in some way, shape, or form. Last week at youth, I took a poll and 100% of the people in the room thought there must be some kind of meaning to life. But the very next question one will ask is simply this. Who is the one or the thing that gives me my meaning? And the question of God will come up because if one believes in God, they believe three things immediately. Number one, that God must have created them. Number two, therefore, because God created them, he's over them. Number three, therefore, God provides one with meaning. So for the sake of us on a journey to find meaning, we must explore if there is evidence for God that we can find and explore the different ways people view life. 
And the lens in which we need to ask this is we need to go back to the fundamental question of the beginning. How was this universe created? If we can figure out how the universe was created and the different views people have on this, we can really get to the heart to the answer of who gives me meaning. And there's three prominent views anywhere in the world philosophically can hold about how the universe was created. Number one, the first view is necessity. We just had to happen. Number two, chance. We just got super lucky. And number three, designer. We were designed by someone or something. Let's explore the three. We're going to take a look at necessity first. Number one, necessity. Necessity tells us that the universe has to be life permitting, so therefore it's necessary, so therefore it happened. Someone who would hold to this view would be called a nihilist. Nihilism means that we are here because it was necessary and that there is no fundamental meaning or no fundamental truth to anything at all and we do not even have a choice about what we do. We just do it because it's necessary, including the universe. For instance, all the qualities of how everything on this world shows how the air worked perfectly to the strands of DNA we have is just simply because it had to happen. It was necessary. But I believe this is the weakest option of the three because there is no reason and no evidence to suggest how this all came to be was necessary. To me, it seems like an empty philosophical guess with no fundamental backing to it. Weakest of the three in my opinion. But let's look at chance first, number two. Someone who believes that our universe was created by chance will tell us that we are here because of what we call a glorious accident and which is commonly called the Big Bang Theory, a theory that was coined in about the 1800s. The theory tells us that we got very, 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 very lucky. In fact, mathematicians have been able to say that it was approximately a 1 in 70 million chance that our universe was created the way it was perfectly on the first try. Someone who believes that our universe was created by chance is what we would call a physicalist worldview, meaning that there is no God, there is no inherent meaning in life, except the most of what you can do while you are here on this earth. Physicalism tells us that the reality in which we see life is only in this physical world. Nothing spiritual, no heaven, nothing outside between the five senses we can see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. The five senses. It is held by a common belief that humans are here by chance, we're a glorious accident, and a physicalist teaches that a person is ultimately an illusion. And when we die, we will simply cease to exist and there will be nothing outside of our life here on earth. The idea of how we got to where we are today, to me, that it's a 1 in 70 million chance on the first try is a fairly weak option that I do not want to put my faith in, my real trust in. The universe lottery is not a very good or a very probable option to me to put my faith on. But let us look at the last option, number three, designer. Perhaps the way our universe got to where it is today because the designer created it. To me, it seems there's powerful evidence behind the idea that someone designed how this universe came to be. If you think about it, what are the odds that our earth was created in such a way that we breathe the perfect amount of air, there are, every individual's DNA coding is so complex that if one human's DNA could com be compiled into a book, it would take us approximately 67 years to read it. But yet, it is made in a way that we function. If we look at the sky, the impression of what was designed, overwhelmingly, it causes us to ask, did somebody design this? One who believes in this would be uh, one who would hold the view of transcendence, which simply means that there is someone who goes over us in knowledge, power, and love, and this is the person who created us, created the world, created the universe, and gives meaning to you through the designer who created it. And Christianity claims that this being is God. The very first verse in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, tells us this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that the very beginning was God, and what God did is he created us. He created the earth. He created the heavens. Psalms 19, 1 to 2 describes the design of God in the skies and the heavens such as this. It says this, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. We see that God designed the sky 
And as it proclaims, it reveals God and His glory. We are told to look no further to the sky because it shows us how awesome God is who reigns over us. Hebrews 3, 4, perhaps one of my favorite verses in the Bible right now says this, For every house has a builder, but the one who built everything is God. It's true. Our houses have to be built by someone. But this third view here tells us that God is the one who's the builder of the world. He holds it in his hands. So with these three views laid out on how the universe was created, I want to suggest, in my opinion, the strongest option to pursue is the designer option. That there is a God who exists and there is a God who created us. But I want to give us a working definition of who God is so we can be on the same page here. And it's this. God is a personal being than which none greater can be conceived. That's the definition. The idea that God is a personal being and that he is the greatest of greats, the king of kings, the lord of lords, means that he is greater than anyone can conceive. And next, we need to define what faith is. Faith, by definition, is not blind to trust. It is trusting what you have good reason to believe is truth. When someone says, I have faith in God, that doesn't mean, well, I blindly trust God and hope that he's right and he's real. What they mean, or should mean, is I have real trust and I believe in God and that he is truth. And I believe that there are actually very good factual and experiential reasons to believe that a relational God is out there who loves you and that there's a relational God who made you exist itself. Christianity is unique because it offers us two forms of evidence for God. Number one, factual evidence, the facts. Number two, experiential evidence, how we feel, how we experience life. And I'm going to spend time to present to you factual evidence of God's existence and experiential evidence of God's existence. Let us start with the factual. I'm going to give you three pieces of factual evidence that I believe are so profound in how I've been able to perceive how God exists. The first is called the Kalam Cosmological Argument. It is one of the most debated and one of the most sought out ways to think about how God exists. And it tells us these three simple things. Number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Number two, the universe began to exist. Number three, therefore the universe has a cause. So that's pretty complicated. But I want to explain it through the illustration of dominoes. Now I don't have dominoes with me, but I want you to imagine this. Think about God's existence like dominoes falling over. Imagine you have dominoes on a flat table in your house. Just imagine that. What has to happen in order for those dominoes to fall over? Well, what you need to do is you need to push those dominoes with your hand. And everything else caused by domino before the domino will be the hand. And all those dominoes will fall over and crash down. You see, God is like the hand that set the dominoes, the universe, into existence. God is the first cause. And if you think about it, in the beginning of time, someone had to first eternally exist, be there for everything else to come into motion. And I believe that God is that person. He is described in the Bible as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning to the end, everlasting to everlasting, meaning, and we can't philosophically wrap our minds around this fully, but God is the first being ever there. He was never created. God has just always been there and will always be. And he was the first mover of all things. Now again, it's trippy because we can't comprehend that fully. But if you think about it, it must make sense. There had to be a first mover. And I believe God is that person. The second piece of evidence I want to give you is intelligent design. If you think about it, our world is very complex. Think about the human body for a moment. Science tells us that one human being has 37 trillion cells of DNA coding inside of us, approximately. That is billions of billions of billions of billions of billions of billions, so on, so forth. So much so, like I just said, if we put it into a book, it would take us 67 years to read just one person's DNA coding. And if we think about the rest of the world, the particles in the air, how oxygen and carbon dioxide perfectly mixes so we can breathe, our world is so complicated that there is no way our universe was created by accident because it just had to happen or it was just something that needed to happen, it needed to come into motion just because it did. But what if an intelligent designer created all of these things that someone who had knowledge above the world itself was able to set all things into existence because he knew exactly how to? And I believe that person's God who created everything 
who knows all things, including the amount of hair on your head, the DNA coding inside of you, and everything else. Now, the last piece of God's evidence I want to propose to you is simple but profound. Let's call it the argument of air. God's existence is like the air we breathe. Are you sitting in a room surrounded by you, by air? Obviously. Can you see the air? Well, no. But can you know that it's there? Or do you know that it's there? Well, of course you do. And it's everywhere in the world for every human all at once, correct? Yes, but you can't see it. No. In the same way, God's existence is like the air we breathe. You do not see him because he's an invisible God, but he's everywhere. He's like the air you breathe. These are the three of the many ways that we can wrap our minds around God's existence. And there's more arguments and more philosophical thinking and explanations, trust me. And I believe there's many strong logical and factual evidences for God's existence. But what about the experiential? What about personal experience? Simply put, people are more convinced about their own experiences and their own life than they are of the experience of factual evidence. So I'm going to share from my own life. For me personally, growing up, I discounted God's existence. I would pray, well, God, if you're there, move that chair. Or God, if you're there, turn off the lights. I know we've all been there. But you see, that's not how God works. He's not someone who seeks to be tested. and He's not our genie in the bottle. He's the one who created us, loves us, reveals himself in ways that are both radical and hidden. For me, when I was 16 years old, I've heard God's voice. And listen, I'm a relatively well-educated man. I would like to say I'm logical and my mental health is good, I think. But the turning point of my life was there was a moment where God spoke to me verbally and it's only happened once in my life. And God said to these two simple words to me, youth group. So what happened to me is I eventually came to this very youth group, Ebenezer Youth, through the words and the way God just showed me. And I drove to this youth group and God radically changed my life. Eventually I became a leader. And then eventually I became the youth pastor. And now I've come full circle and I'm now leading this youth group because God's voice speaking to me the words youth group. I don't know about you, but that seems like a little bit of God doing a lot of work. Like, come on. And I can go on. I've seen God do miracles in people's lives. People being healed miraculously without a physical explanation. People's lifestyles and attitudes flipped upside down because of God. I've seen a lot of things happen in my life that shows me that God must be real because I personally experienced it. And I know the experiences I've seen God work in is no delusion to how I live. I've arrived at a conclusion both logically and experientially that God must exist. Not only do I think God gives us the best explanation for how to live life, but when we think deeply about it, I know that he's personally transformed my own life and the lives around me. My belief in God's existence was not formed by a single piece of factual evidence, but rather accumulation of multiple lines of evidence, both factual and experiential. And I don't believe that this is simply just truth for me, but I think the person of Jesus and the one who loves you is truth for you too. You see, truth must be objective, meaning truth is truth, meaning not everything can be true. And God existing is true. You have meaning because God gave it to you because he created you in his own image, because he loves you. Not only there's a God who exists, but there's a God who exists to desire a relationship with you. So with all this said, what do we do with this today? And I have two thoughts for you today on how you can start thinking to apply this. Number one, continue to investigate and look for the evidence of God's existence. I can tell you with confidence, my investigation of the truth has landed me with a strong belief in God's existence. But you need to personally consider this and continue to look at the evidence. Being able by your own free will and volition to choose is important. It is how I believe God has designed you. So continue to investigate for God's existence. Number two, I want to encourage you to look for the small ways in how God's working in your life. life. I'm gonna say that again. Number two, look for the small ways how God is working in your life. I want you to be intentional with something. In our everyday life, we do not see how much God's working in our life. We don't even realize it. I think this is important. We need to look for the small things he's doing that we may not notice in our everyday life. So I want to challenge you to something. Be intentional to observe the small things that are happening every day in your life. Romans 1 19 21 tells us this. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. 
For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. You see, when we look at this world, we can see that God is there. We have no excuse for not knowing God. Hebrews 11.6 tells us we ultimately need to believe God exists as it says this. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who comes to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. You see, Christianity tells us that it believes in a universe which God created, which is full of evidence that points to him. And if we seek to come to him, we need to believe he's there. Often we doubt God and we want him to prove himself to us, such as me telling God to turn the lights off. But you see, God's already proven himself so many times through the person of Jesus and other countless things he's done. In the Chronicles of Narnia, a famous series of books by the person C.S. Lewis, Edmund, a character, right, yells out, why doesn't he prove himself to us more? And his little sister Lucy has this amazing, beautiful, incredible faith. Says back to Edmund, well, why don't we try to prove ourselves to him more? And I think this is a posture to have. I believe we can prove God's real with lots of evidence, but we will only continue to doubt and only yell out to him more to prove himself to us. But there is good and logical reason to believe in God. Why don't we prove ourselves to him more? Why don't we try to follow him better? Why don't we live our lives trying to love him, especially if we know he exists? But it goes back to you and your choice and your investigation of the truth. Do you believe God exists? Let me pray before we end. God, I pray as we investigate the truth in your reality, I pray that you would reveal yourself. If you're there, show us who you are. Show us your love. Show us the reality of your heart. We thank you for who you are and this opportunity for me to share. Amen. Awesome. See you later, Ebenezer Youth. It was great chatting with you. Peace out.